Welcome to the Word of Truth. I realize for many of you, you've not watched this program a great deal in the past, if ever. But thank you for joining us for this time of Bible study that follows the curriculum that's used in life groups and Sunday school classes throughout the United States. We want you to join us every week for this time at this time of Bible study. We take these programs in advance, so we won't be talking about the pandemic, but we will be studying God's Word each week. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you're watching this program, thank you so much for watching The Word of Truth. I always appreciate when someone stops me and tells me that they watch the program. I just, I appreciate it very, very much. And I almost always will say, I didn't know anyone was looking at it. I'm really kind of joking when I say that, but I do, as does the entire crew, covet and greatly appreciate your prayers and thank you so much for watching the program back in february a lady stopped me one morning as i was going to, to one of our satellite campuses and I, I actually had arrived at one of our satellite campuses but i was going into the worship area and she said i watch that program every week but not on sunday apparently she watches on a friday because we teach the sunday school lesson that's what we do here on the word of truth the sunday school lesson she watches it in advance before Sunday. So if that's your habit, I appreciate that as well. Years ago, that was uh, not, a pos not possible with this program. Uh, the Word of Truth was live 25 or so years ago, and it happened right here in the same, not the exact same set. It's changed a little bit, although not very much. Like my attire, not, not a lot of changes, but years ago, in this very same studio location, uh, the program was live every Sunday morning. It was remarkable uh, that the tech crew was able to get all those things done. And as you know, as I've shared on more than one occasion, we now record these programs to some degree far in advance. You're watching this program near the last of April, and uh, we're taping this program, recording this program much earlier uh, in the year than when you're watching it, which is another one of the reasons that we've uh, done away as we have done for so many years with recognizing birthdays. But I still would love to say, if you're having a birthday anytime near this date, have a very wonderful birthday. Here we are coming to the end of this month. And, uh, you know, the old song used to say, though April showers may come your way, they bring the flowers. Well, we'll see how all of that works out, just like we'll see as we continue to watch um, just believing God for the outcome with the way things are shaping up in our nation as well as the world. So I just appreciate the time that we have to spend together. And isn't the title of today's uh, Sunday School lesson, if you haven't already looked at it, I hope that you will join me over in Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 5, and we'll go all the way through verse 15. But isn't the title, if you have looked at the t today's lesson in our quarterly, isn't the title wonderful? Saved, one word, but it implies, it promises, it delivers so very, very much. So the word saved is our uh, Sunday school lesson title for today. And man, we are going to get into it. But before we do that, I want to remind you as well that we do appreciate you writing to us. And the address is on the screen, and we'll put it up again near the end of the program in case you don't have a pencil and a piece of paper to jot it down now. But if you'd like, you can write to us, and we would love to receive your letter or a postcard, a short note of any kind, any, any kind of missive. If you want to tell me where I've messed up, you go ahead and write that too. But the address is The Word of Truth, 1209th Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. That address again is The Word of Truth, 1209th Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and the zip code is 76301. Last week we were much earlier, well not much, but we were back, a little further back in Romans, and the folks who put the quarterlies together have seen fit to once again leapfrog ahead a little bit. So I hope you have your Bibles, because it's a Bible study that we're engaged in, and you'll join me in Romans chapter 10, beginning with verse 5, as we look at some folks who would have seemed to have had a lock hold on a relationship with God, but elected not to receive His Son, and others who by grace have been saved, but they sure don't have like any of us do not have, a right or uh, shouldn't take the opportunity to boast about it. 
Chapter 10, the book of Romans, beginning with verse 5. Let's see what God's Word says. Paul has been making his case steadily. God has, God has been making his case through Paul, I should say has been making the case steadily throughout the book. First, as you know, we studied in the earlier chapters the just sinfulness that, that all mankind is mired in, that we're trapped in. It's because sin came in through Adam and Eve down through the ages, it continues to inflict its terrible turmoil and its, its horrific consequence on all of us. But we know that through the blood of Christ, we can obtain forgiveness for that sin. And heaven only knows I have that need all the time in my life. And I take the time to confess before my Heavenly Father where I fail and I ask His forgiveness and I ask Him to help me not continue on in that same fashion. Paul's been building the case for the need for salvation. And here in chapter 10, he's going to give us some very strong pegs on which to hang our beliefs in the salvation and the opportunity for same through Jesus Christ. Chapter 10 beginning with verse 5, Moses described in this way the righteousness that is by the law. Remember, the law was the means of adjudication. The law was the means to understand where we erred. It's kind of like I have to make a drive now fairly regularly down I-45 south of the Dallas-Fort Worth area down near South Texas. And that to me has become almost like the Audubon. I try to keep my car on a speed, or my pickup truck rather, my wife's pickup truck, on a speed control that just says here's 75 and just hit cruise control and off we go down the road. That can almost get you killed on that highway. But there are posted speed limits. Now, they're there for recommendation, but they're also there for enforcement. There is a reason why the authorities have recommended 75. It's because they feel that that's a safe traveling speed. And they also, uh, years ago when they brought us down to 55 everywhere, they thought it would be fuel, more fuel efficient. There's a reason why they've posted those speed limits. But there are a lot of folks who either seemingly ignore them or don't really care that they're posted. God gave us the law so that we could understand when you err, when you go in the wrong direction, when you go at too rapid a rate of speed, as it were, there are consequences. There could be a significant ticket uh, coming with that ticket, a fine, or there could even be um, even worse, perhaps uh, uh, being held by the authorities and your car impounded, or even worse, a wreck perhaps leading to the death of someone else. So there are laws that are there for our protection. Moses, God gave him the law. And Moses described it in this way, the righteousness that is by the law, the man who does these things will live by them. In other words, if you're choosing to live by the law, if for some reason or another you're still under the mistaken impression that doing everything to the finest dotting of the I and crossing of the T will result in salvation, then you're going to have to live by every part of the law. Moses had described it that way. But the, but the righteous, verse 6 says of chapter 10, the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart, in other words, don't try to make the argument that, who will say in your heart, uh, do not say rather in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the depth, or the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does the word of God really say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. And by the way, he is to juxtaposition those two uh, later and say it's in your heart, it's in your mouth. There's no real secret formula to the chronology or the uh, statement of this fact. But there is importance based on both things. Our confession and our belief are very important. The word is near you, he says in verse 8, back part of it. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you and how can we be saved will listen. Paul says it, as it's said in other parts of God's word as well. But here in chapter 10, beginning with verse 9, Paul says it very clearly and very succinctly. And we're going to break it down because some of you watching this program today, maybe you think you're here by chance, but you're not. This is what we like to call a divine appointment. For someone watching this program today, you may not know Christ as your Savior. You may need a Savior. 
everyone does. But maybe you're feeling in your heart and in your life, your sin, the things you've done wrong, they are so black, they are so bad, you'll never be forgiven and you've just resigned yourself to live in a life of sorrow and despair, bleakness, sadness, because you think, I'll never get above this. I might as well just keep acting like everybody else I know who's running the wrong direction because there's no hope for me. Well, there is. And Paul says it like this in chapter 10 of the book of Romans, verse 9. Mm, this is so powerful. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That bears reiteration. In fact, that bears a lot of reiteration, but let's read it again. Verse 9 of chapter 10. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. The Word of God tells us, and your quarterly correctly points this out in looking at this passage, that at the end, every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. What you don't want to do, what you must not do, is wait until the end or wait until it's too late to make that confession. I promise you this, all the gangsters in the world, all the dealers, all the pimps, all the traffickers, all of the, no, one day all of that lifestyle will come crashing down around their hairs, around perhaps where you're watching this program today, you're thinking, well, it's going to come crashing down on mine. You don't have to live that Form that kind of life any longer. There is salvation. It's available, but it's only available through one person, Jesus Christ. It's not available through the prophet Muhammad. It's not available through Elijah Muhammad. It's not available through Louis Farrakhan. It's not available through uh, the Buddha. It's not available through Joseph Smith or any of his successors. It's only one person and one person alone. Jesus said, I am the way uniquely, I am the truth uniquely, and the life uniquely. No man comes to the Father except by me. Paul, writing to these two different groups of folks who have come together, they're in Rome, the Gentile and the Jew. Jewish people, he says, Moses told you if you're going to live by the law, you better be prepared because you cannot live up to it. No one can. It's by grace we're saved, not of works. Only Christ, He's the only one who ever lived who was without any sin. So if you're watching this program today and you're saying, what I've done, there's no forgiveness for, that's not true. The Word of God says there's only one sin from which we cannot be forgiven. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which that's a big old word. It basically means it's attributing to Satan those things which are of God. When Jesus said, be careful, you're about to commit the sin for which there is no forgiveness, he was talking to those people who were saying, well, it's through Satan that he's been, been able to do all these miraculous deeds. No, it was God's power in him. How can your life change? Only through Christ. How can your destiny be altered? Only with a relationship with Christ and our Heavenly Father, God. It won't come. It's wonderful. I applaud everyone who's achieved sobriety and, and, and living a, a clean life through whatever 12-step program you work. But trust me when I tell you, without Christ, without God in your life, all you're doing, all you're doing is maintaining that illusion of wholeness and fulfillment. When you know Christ, you know true peace. When you know Christ, you know what it is to be truly loved. Paul said all those years ago and down through the ages to you and I today, if we confess, or as he addressed those folks there, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Two things here. Confess with our mouth. Now, some of you may say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to speak. Okay. You can still give evidence. Baptism for instance, does not save anyone. The, the form of expression through baptism is a form of obedience. 
But it's also, and I, I paused for a minute because I want to make sure I, I, I say this exactly the way God's laid it on my heart. It's more than just the act of obedience. It is an outward expression of what's taken place inwardly in our heart. So if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're saying out loud, I can't have no other gods before him. He is, to be Lord is singular. You can't have many lords. They did in England. Oh, they did in various aristocracies. And I love reading history and you'll go back there and you'll see the lords and ladies and all this stuff. No. The true meaning of the word is that sovereign that reigns over all. So if Jesus is truly Lord of your life, narcotics are not. Alcohol is not. Porn is not. Um, workaholism is not. All these things from which people desire so, so strongly in their heart to be freed, Jesus is the only Lord. He, can, he is the only one who can be Lord. And when we confess that with our mouth in the first part of what Paul's describing here in verse 9, we're saying, I'll have no other gods before him, and I won't let anything else run my life. So if we first confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and then believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that's the hope. That's the promise that we have. The Word of God tells us not to be without hope as those who do not have any belief. Oh, body of Christ, how many famous people, how many wealthy people, how many big shots, if you will, if I may use colloquialism, how many folks who were held in high esteem died went to their eternal reward only to find out that it was not a reward. It was an eternal punishment. We want to think that somehow or another there's a get-out-of-jail-free card for every person who's ever been alive. That universal salvation that would be so wonderful if it was true but is not God's plan and so is false. If we believe that God raised Christ from the dead, then we believe in the first fruit. We believe in the hope that can only come through someone who beat death. We can't beat it ourselves. You know, they used to say the old expression, there are only two things that are certain, death and taxes. Well, I'm not so certain anymore about taxes because I don't know how that's going to work as I've continued to age, but I know this. We all have an expiration date. Every one of us, every one of us does. It is a point of the Word of God says unto every man, that's by the way, neuter gender, both men and women, it's appointed unto every one a time to die. But death has been defeated. And the Word of God says, in fact, we will not all die. 1 Corinthians 15, but in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. We will be translated from this earthly abode and this sometimes so futile, sad life to hope and joy everlasting where there is no sorrow, where there is no regret. Hopefully, where there is no regret, some folks would teach, and I've heard it taught on more than one occasion that there are regrets in heaven. If that's the case, don't let it be that way your life. Don't have regrets by making the most of what you can do for God right now. But nevertheless, there will be no sorrow. We're told that in the Word. There will be no sorrow in heaven. You don't have, you don't have to live the rest of your life enslaved to whatever it is that's got you enslaved. I, I claim this for myself and I claim it for anybody watching this program today. Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. If you do the same thing, right this very minute, wherever you are, wherever you're watching this program, if you're listening to me behind bars, if you're listening to me in a hotel room where you know you shouldn't be because you're doing things you know are detrimental to your life, if you're listening to me in your home and your life is upside down and your world is topsy-turvy, wherever you are, Christ can change your life. Christ can change your heart. Christ can be your Lord and Master. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, say it with me right now, Jesus is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, Paul said it, God said it through Him, and we believe it to this day, 
you will be saved. Mm. Oh, that's so strong. So verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe. Now he's reversed, he reversed the role. A minute ago is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart. Now he starts with the heart. So there's no secret formula, as your quarterly correctly points out, to the order in which these things are said. Here's the way Paul says it in verse 10. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. You, me, none of us can do anything to bring about our salvation. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, though, there does have to be a step on our part. Does that mean I have some role in my salvatory, in my salvation experience? No, not at all. But God does want us to acknowledge Him. Too often you'll hear people who live lives of just wanton, wanton sin, just anything they can do, anything they want to do, and then they'll say, but Jesus has got my back. It's not the case, but it's an interesting thought. It's a strange hypothesis, but it's not true. We have to be believers in Christ. Does He universally save everyone? That's not what the Word says. That's not what the Word says. In fact, the Word says there is going to be a place of eternal punishment, a place of eternal damn. And you can say, I don't believe it. It's not for me. So since I don't believe it, it's not so. That's not the case. I've used this illustration for 30-something years since uh, moving to Wichita Falls years ago. And I can remember one of the tallest buildings I f first saw when I came here was a building they call Old Big Blue or something like that. And it's a fairly good-sized building for Wichita. And I used to tell people, and I'll say it again today, you can throw yourself off the top of that building and as you uh, head towards the pavement below, at the top of your lungs as you have the opportunity, you can yell, I don't believe in gravity. If you get that long before you hit the earth, it won't matter. You'll still splatter like an egg upon your impacting with the pavement. You can say, I don't believe in heaven, I don't believe in hell. It doesn't matter. When you die and you've not made the choice for Christ, it will be too late, the Word of God says, for you to make the choice you should have made in the time you were given right now. This is for somebody watching this program. You need to make that decision right now to do as he just said in verse 9. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right there, wherever you are. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Listen, it's true, it happened. If you need evidence, go find the book, The Case for Christ. You can almost always find it at a, a Christian bookstore like uh, Mardell's or something like that. In fact, you can often, often find it online somewhere. Go read that book if you need some kind of tactile proof. But it, it's true, it happened. The Buddha didn't come back from the dead. Muhammad never even got to Jerusalem, so he didn't ascend to heaven from the Dome of the Rock. No, none of that stuff happened. It's, that's fairy tales. That's made-up religion. Jesus Christ appeared to more than 500 people after His resurrection. It's one of the most documented parts of world history. It's not just something I'm saying to you today on your TV set. It happened. You need to know Him as your Lord and Savior. Anyone, verse 11 says, the Scripture says, anyone who trusts Him in Him will never be put to shame. Verse 10 is said, it's when you, in your heart that you believe and with your mouth you confess and say, be saved. And then verse 11, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Don't you know that hell and eternity in it is going to be an awful, never-ending time? And there will be weeping, the word of God says, and wailing and gnashing of teeth. <sighs> I've heard it described as, think about the worst pain you've ever endured. Perhaps it, perhaps it was a toothache. And, and before uh, a, a wonderful uh, dentist or a doctor of dentistry could get in there and remove whatever the abscess was or get rid of the, the, uh, the, the, the thing that was causing the pain and get it packed and, and numb the area around it, the pain was excruciating. You thought, would it ever end? But you knew that if you, finally you would relieve, was, receive rather relief. You would receive relief for that pain. There'll never be any end to the pain. 
You won't go to sleep and think, maybe tomorrow I'll wake up without the symptoms of the flu, or maybe I'll tomorrow I'll wake up and I won't have this stomach virus, or maybe tomorrow I'll wake up and I won't have the arthritic pain that I'm still enduring now, or I'll be able to take something for that. It never ends. Trust me when I tell you, you don't want that for unending time. It never, never stops. So you won't be put to shame for knowing him. Verse 12, there's no difference. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord over all and richly blesses all who call on him. Maybe you think, I can't be saved because I'm not one of the select chosen few that uh, know the right words to say or dress in the proper attire, or go to the right church, or uh, have lived a life with a silver spoon. Or No. Paul was saying back then, and he's coming down through the ages to you and me today as we read God's Word, it's being said the same way to us. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, between the rich and the poor, between the haves and the have-nots, between the clean and those who are still using, between the, the inebriated and those who are walking a life and a path of sobriety. There's no difference because Jesus is going to be and is Lord of all. Now the difference becomes who accepts Him, who confesses with their mouth that He is Lord and believes in their heart that God has raised Him from the dead, and those who don't. That's where the separation will tr take place. It won't have anything to do with how much money you've got. It won't have anything to do with how high or low you are. Old Garth Brooks used to sing a terrible song, I've got friends in low places where, you know, listen, it don't matter if you're in the low place. God doesn't want you to stay there. He sure didn't design your life to be lived there. He wants you to know freedom through Christ. Oh, he says it doesn't matter. Jesus is Lord of all. The Lord is the Lord of all, and He richly blesses all who call on Him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Don't let this day go by without doing that. How then can they call on the one they've not believed, and how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? How can they hear without preaching? How can they preach unless they're sent? Paul closes this little part of chapter 10 by saying what we do on this program is so essential and that's why I spent so much of it today sharing the plan of salvation. We've all sinned. We have need of a Savior. The only way we get saved is through Jesus Christ. When we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we can be saved and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't don't turn this TV off, or, or in fact, maybe do turn this TV off and do that right now. If you've never asked Christ in your heart, do that right now. If you'd share that with us, we'll send you a book on how to get started in your new Christian walk. You can see the address on the screen, The Word of Truth, 1200 9th Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, and our zip code is 76301. Write that down, The Word of Truth, 1200 9th Street, Wichita Falls, Texas, 76301. But be sure and include in your letter, or if you call us, tell us, I just accepted Christ. What do I do next? Because we need to know what we need to send to you. I appreciate so much you watching this program. Next week, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is going to be part of what we're looking at. So I hope you'll join us again next week as we continue our study in Romans. And remember, we appreciate you watching this program and your prayers. See you then. You've been watching The Word of Truth from First Baptist Church, Wichita Falls. Join us again next week for The Word of Truth. 